But you know, the world of sports provides a beautiful picture of God's grace. All right? It really does. It really, really does. Even ESPN provides us a picture of God's grace. You're like, Pastor Howell, you have done lost your marbles. Where are you going this morning with that? Well, think about this. that Often on a, on a sports channel or a sports show, they will have what we call a highlight reel. You can go back and you can see a highlight reel of Michael Jordan. Some who would argue he was the greatest athlete or perhaps the greatest basketball player of all time. You watch that highlight reel, you'll, you'll watch him make shot after shot after shot. In fact, you would believe, watching the highlight reel, that Michael Jordan never missed a shot. Would you not? Game on the line in a highlight reel, the shot's going in. You never bet against a highlight reel. He's not making this one because in a highlight reel, it's going in, isn't it? I remember the first time that I watched a highlight reel of Michael Jordan and when he put, did a putback dunk off a free throw. Someone missed a free throw and he runs in the, from the corner of the screen, jumps from it seems like the, the free throw line, and while everyone is watching and waiting for the rebound, the ball's already back in the basket. That was incredible. Highlight reel. If you watched a highlight reel of Larry Bird, the same thing, or a highlight reel of, a, of Joe Montana, you would see some amazing throws. You would not see the interceptions. You would not see the misses. You would just see Joe Montana threading the needle with that football. Highlight reel. You know, the Bible tells me, tells us that, that God with us remembers our sins and our iniquities no more. Do you know that? We get to heaven. We get to glory in what he has done. It's a, it's a highlight reel. And here in Daniel chapter 3, if you have your Bibles open to Daniel chapter 3, we have one such highlight reel of three Hebrew children. We began this last Sunday morning, continue this morning, as we look at the account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And if I could draw your attention in Daniel chapter 3 to a couple of verses that I think kind of unlock the whole passage for us. Verse number 16, and where the Bible says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Verse 17 of Daniel chapter 3, If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not... But if not, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Lord, I thank you for the time we have this morning. Lord, I thank you for your goodness, your strength, your power. Lord, thank you that we can trust in a faithful God. Lord, bless us this morning, those who are with us in this building, the other building, or at home. Lord, Lord would you encourage our hearts through your word would you touch us and change us? Lord, may we respond the way we ought to. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Do you know that hope in God empowers us to endure even the most difficult circumstances? Now, obviously, uh, to not state the, or not to state the obvious, that we are facing a semi-difficult crisis in America, right? The coronavirus. Maybe not as bad as everyone is saying. Maybe. We don't know. Everyone has their own opinion on that. Be it as it may, uh, they are reacting like it's a pretty, pretty awful thing, correct? That is a surprise to anyone this morning. Of course not. And this sermon this morning is not about or against a coronavirus. All right, this is the second part of a sermon I started last week that was planned uh, a few months before that. But I think it's fitting and, and that God would have us learn some things from Daniel chapter 3, one of the most familiar passages and stories in the Bible. You can't hardly go to Sunday school and not learn about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Remember, our theme this year is, I believe God. Now, those on live stream, those in the gym, get to learn this morning that the upstairs, the, the video cameras, hate it when I move. You see, when Pastor Lett, he's here this morning, and you pray for him, he's had a couple meetings uh, get, get rescheduled and canceled. But Pastor Lett, because he had bad knees, he only moved um, this way, horizontal on the stage. 
So they'd slide the camera back and forth because your knees, Pastor Wright, didn't enable you to really get up and down quickly. My knees are still young, and so I test them every service. When I do that, the guys upstairs, like, they're like, Pastor Howell, you move way too much, all right? So if you're somewhere else, I apologize. If you don't see my face, count it as a blessing. Write it in your blessing list. And now I have to see Pastor Howell's face for a little bit. But what a familiar story. The three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. I mentioned this last week. I remember on the flannel graph, all right, that thing, that board on an easel in Sunday school where they'd put like these, these uh, pictures that would stick to the flannel graph like some Velcro or something, some kind of magic potion, all right, made them stick. And the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar built on the flannel graph stuck way above the top of it. Little kid, you're like, wow, it must have been huge. And it was, and it was pretty large, about 90 feet tall. Remember, this ceiling's about 32 or 33 feet, so about three times higher than the, than the ceiling in this auditorium. About two tractor trailers end on end, and about as high as Michael Jordan can jump, about as high, 90 feet. But you remember that uh, in, this, in this account, boy, Nebuchadnezzar built this golden image. It was an image to maybe of himself, but to a worshipped deity, all right? Whether it was himself or one of the gods in the Babylon, we're not exactly sure. It was definitely not built for our god, Jehovah. You remember how, how it went that when the music were to play, it was their worship music. Hmm. You mean there's worship music for a false god? Well, yes, there is. How about that? How about that? I wonder if it sounded like amazing grace. Did it sound like that? What, what, what do you mean? You mean it sounded different than that? I bet it did. But that's a side note. Don't get me off track. I already did a series on music, all right? If you haven't heard it or seen it, go on YouTube. It's there. And when the music played, everyone would bow down. It was a public it was a public thing. And you remember that there were three Hebrew children who did not stand, who did not worship, who remained standing. We looked at the pagan royalty, the prominent revelation, and the public reverence. This morning I'll draw our attention to verse number eight of Daniel chapter three. Where the Bible says, Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused of the Jews. They spake and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, uh, um, thou O king, hast made a decree. That every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, but psaltery, dull, small kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worship, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. In verse 12, there are certain Jews. There are certain Jews. Did you catch that? There are certain Jews. It appears that it wasn't all the Jews. You see that? It appears like it wasn't all the Jews. Now, I would argue this again. I mentioned last week a reason that Daniel's not mentioned is most likely he was off on the king's business. You will not convince me that Daniel was here during this thing and worshipped the, the, the golden image. I do not find that to line up with any part of Scripture. Daniel was a man who followed God faithfully and continually from the time he was young until the time he was old. So the fact that he was not mentioned does not mean for a second that he worshipped this false idol. One such person wrote this. I'll mention this again as well. They said it proves the authenticity of Daniel because Daniel's not mentioned. They said if Daniel was fake, they brought up this point of Daniel, the book of Daniel was a fake, and Daniel is the hero of Daniel. Chapter 1, he's a hero. Chapter 2, he's a hero. He'll be the hero again in, in 4 and 5 and 6, and later on, he'll be the hero. They said if, if Daniel was a fake book, a fictional book, why would you write out the hero for a chapter? Interesting point. But, but Daniel's not mentioned, but it says there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. I want to mention this morning there was a purposeful refusal. They were different because of their faith. They were faithful because of their faith. They were known because of their faith. They were despised because of their faith. They were mocked because of their faith. And they were called out because of their faith. I just wonder, uh, church family and those who are saved, does your faith result in any response? Their faith wasn't hidden, was it? It was out there for all to see. It was out there for the whole country. Whoever wanted to see, could see these certain Jews who would not bow down. Does your faith 
evoke any kind of response. Sometimes our faith is a silent faith, a capitulating faith, a compromising faith. But these young Hebrew men had a faith that was different because they chose to believe God. In 1837, three young Methodist ministers, James Calvert, John Hunt, and Thomas Jagger, and their wives set out from England to the Fiji Islands. Theirs was a difficult assignment. Their work was only three years old, and the people were still cannibals. That's a difficult work, to go minister to cannibals. What's for supper? Hopefully not me. Don't invite me for supper in any way, shape, or form. As the story goes, hardly any fruit was seen during their first few years of service. Then in 1845, revival swept through. One of the chiefs who had been a main opponent to the mission work was converted to Christ. And in fact, within a few years, as the, the account goes, a complete transformation of the islands had taken place as the gospel took hold of the people there. The captain of the ship that took the three English couples from England had tried to persuade them to change their minds. And he told one of the missionaries, you will lose your lives and the lives of those with you if you go among such savages. And missionary Calvert replied, we died before we ever came here. As a Christian, we are crucified with Christ. We've died before we've ever come here. And God is looking for authentic men and women, men who will live for Him, who will love Him with their whole heart, not just when it's convenient, but all the time. Our faith will be tested. And God is looking for some faith. I see next of all the response, though. Verses 14 through 23 of the response. First of all, the king. This is interesting that Nebuchadnezzar has a response and starts in verse number 13, Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage, in his fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar was full of wrath over the response of the king. He was irresponsible and irrational. You'll notice in the, and I won't take all the time now to explain this or, or talk about it, but Nebuchadnezzar is completely off his rocker right now. He can't believe that, that three of, the, of his, of his uh, people he'd set up in charge of some, some affairs in the province of Babylon would resist his order to worship his image. If the Bible says rage and fury, he is not thinking clearly. He asks them and commands that the furnace is heated up, how many times hotter? Seven times hotter. Can you imagine? Measure, now, why the number seven? Why seven? It could be perfection. Some people have said that. Or was it just because Nebuchadnezzar was so angry he chose an arbitrary number? You know what? It's like some parents when you ground your kids. You are grounded for the rest of your life. Why the rest of their life? For one year, for 16 months. Can you just see him just so incensed that these men would stand up in their faith that he just said, listen, heat it up seven times. Boy, this baby was hot. Don't forget at the beginning of the account, the punishment was already, if you didn't bow, you got thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. You're already going to be dead, but now you're going to be dead even worser <laughs> because it's seven times hotter. It doesn't make any sense. Nebuchadnezzar is just incensed. He's, like the Bible says, he is full of rage and full of fury. He's irresponsible. He's irrational. Commands these young men to be bound. Did you notice they're not putting up a fight at this point, right? The Bible doesn't tell us they're swinging away at it, right? He commands them to be bound, and then and notice that he commands them to be thrown into the furnace, but the Bible, in verse number 20, tells us something interesting. He commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hose, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, verse 22, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I want to pause here real quick and just talk about something very briefly. 
the book of James, we read this verse, that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Nebuchadnezzar responded in irrational, irresponsible anger. He, he caused the furnace to be heated up seven times hotter. He caused these men who were not fighting, they were not a threat of running, to be bound in their hats and their coats and their garments. And then he caused, and he called for his most mighty men of the army. Why do you need the mightiest men of your army? Unless you're just irrational at this point, right? It wasn't like these three Hebrew children were expert fighters. It wasn't like they had, had you know, fought their way through the crowd and left a trail of, of, of death behind them. Oh, we better call the, the mighty men because if not, we're, you know, these guys are going to escape. I believe it's because he was irrational. And because of that, when those Hebrew children were thrown in the fire, the mighty men were slain. Right? You know that, right? Did you ever think about this? Nebuchadnezzar had some more wars to fight. More wars to fight, and his mightiest men were dead. They were mighty because they'd fought the battles for him. That's why they were mighty. And now, when he goes to war the next time, he doesn't have the mighty men because he wasted them on three young Hebrew men in his irrational rage. Could have been some families who didn't have a dad come home that night because of an irrational, angry, furious king. It was a country that was hurt, of families that were hurt, and Nebuchadnezzar was. He hurt himself in this process. Can I mention this to you, church family? That whenever you respond in anger, you will always lose more than you bargained for. Whenever you respond in anger, you will always lose more than you bargained for. Some of you may have a temper Anger, malice, fury, wrath, call it what you will. If you walk in that, respond in that, you will not escape the consequences just like Nebuchadnezzar didn't escape from that. All right? That's, that's what, how, how God has built this into the, a natural consequence. So you can respond in anger, but when it costs you more, understand that's not God's plan. The wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. It's not the fashion of God. It doesn't display God properly. There's some dads in here, or maybe in the TV viewer land, who need to get alone with God and let Him work in their hearts so they don't respond in anger. Some dads. So you don't treat your kids in anger. So you walk in the Spirit and allow God to move you and shake you so that you rule your house well, not in anger, not in fury, not in wrath, but in love and admonition, walking in the Spirit. Maybe there's some moms, some wives, some young people, teenagers, who are angry. At the time as principal, I heard a lot of things. Heard a lot of things as principal. I've been swore at in my office down there in the school. Nasty words. Words that if they're at home, I would turn off the TV channel. I can't turn off a parent, right? <laughs> because, of, because of anger. I've heard teenagers yell at their parents in anger. I, I, I grew up in a house where that wasn't really tolerated. Right? Come on, anybody else who up that kind of household as well? Anybody trying to raise that kind of household? Listen, I don't want my kids yelling at me. <laughs> they don't want to either. <laughs> they don't want to either. They may try, they have them, they may try it once, once. Nice thing is they're right here, this one right in front of me. All right, <laughs> sitting right there. I can see Johnny right there. Yeah. Anger. Anger. Boy, I've known people quit their job because of anger. Can't get it back. It's gone. Mighty man's burned up. I've known people who have punched a block wall with their hand out of anger. Their hand was broken because block walls always win. <laughs> anger. Anger. Just a side note. Not really the direction of the sermon, but thought it was fitting to mention that Nebuchadnezzar gives us an example of how not to live like the world. Respond in anger. Respond the way we ought to. Boy, the king's response, irrational, irresponsible. And they see the response of the children of the king. I see the response of the children of the king in verses 16 through 18. We read that this morning, how they spoke. 
I noticed three things about this response. It was a certain response. They didn't stutter. They didn't talk about it. They didn't have a meeting. They, they didn't, they didn't uh, have to gather and say, okay, let's, let's uh, script a careful, uh, a careful response. It was a certain response. In fact, the Bible says we are not careful to answer the meaning, meaning we don't have to talk about this, king. We know where we're going with this. We know because of our belief in God what it's going to be. It was a certain response. It was a calm response in contrast to King Nebuchadnezzar as he is foaming at the mouth and spittle seems to be dropping out of his, out of his cheeks and down his, out his chin. It's calm and it's confident. It's a confident response. You see... You can fight fire with faith. You can fight fire with faith. A while back, or years ago back now, I had a, my, my brother was cooking in the kitchen here at First Baptist Church. And the process somehow uh, created a small fire in the kitchen there. It was years ago now. It wasn't, wasn't last week. And he did like most of us were thinking about doing. He tossed water onto the grease fire. Yes. Who knew water and grease don't mix? And grease will float on top of, 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 uh, of water. And, and at that point, um, I came in afterwards, there was black marks everywhere in the kitchen, on the ceiling, on the walls. It was a mess. Because you can't fight a grease fire with water, can you? It won't work. But you can fight fire with faith. Do you have fireproof faith? Do you have fireproof faith? I tell you what, these, boys, these men did, these three Hebrew men did. I love Lamentations chapter 3, where it says, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of God that, that uh, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. I want you to recall this morning that God is still good and we have hope. God has met our needs and we have hope. That our belief in God shows of his mercies. We have hope. What a great time. March the 15th, 2020, to showcase your fireproof faith in a fireproof God. You sick? You need Jesus. He is the ultimate vaccine. We're all infected by the virus of sin in this world. Infected every single person. Jesus is the only one who can cleanse us from our sin and heal us. The Bible says that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. Saved to heaven. Saved to a life of, of, of eternity with Him in heaven. The virus of sin, Jesus is the vaccine. The Bible says, for all have sinned. Come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And 2,000 years later, from the time He lived, Jesus is still the answer. And if you're here today and have never trusted Jesus as your Savior, then you're infected by the virus of sin. And I encourage you today to trust Jesus. He will save you and heal you from your sin. You see, Jesus is the ultimate vaccine. For the virus of worthy or of worry, Jesus is the vaccine. The virus of addiction, Jesus is the vaccine. Jesus is the best thing in the world. Every situation, every occasion, Jesus is it. And here, uh, these, these men, they say, listen, sir, you can't harm us because we have God. <laughs> There's nothing you can do. Throw us in your hottest fiery furnace. We're going to be okay. And lastly, this morning, quickly, I see the results. You know what happened. They tossed the men. The men died. And all of a sudden, they're shocked. Shock on the face of Nebuchadnezzar because he thought for a moment that he was seeing something that shouldn't be there. He asked those around him, did we not throw three in there? I'm glad I wasn't there that day. You say, well, why, Pastor Howell? Well, you may not believe this, but every once in a while, I'm tempted to be sarcastic. You may not know this about me. It would have been hard that moment for the king, Nebuchadnezzar, to really answer him like you want to answer him, right? Right? Did we throw three, three in there? I don't know, boss. You tell me. You know, oh, the boss can't count. All right, I'd be next one in the fire for sure. There was shock. 
Who is that fourth man? Well, we're not surprised because Hebrews 13 tells us that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's in the fire. There's shock there. There's salvation. Save from the furnace. Save from the fire. There's supplication. When the, the Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All of a sudden, his big image, 90 feet tall and about 9 feet wide, was not so big. About 10 minutes earlier, it was beautiful. Now it seemed a little bit less glamorous. Because this image couldn't be in the fire like that seven times hotter. This image couldn't make another person show up. Only the God, the creator of the universe, could do that. And then he promoted them. After all this, he asked them to walk out, so they, they, they walk out. He gives them, verse number 30, a new spot in the province. You see, when I choose to believe God, when I choose to be committed to God, even when my life is on the line, when I choose that nothing will stop me, but my faith in God will overcome every, every fear and worry in my life, when I understand that true faith will withstand even the hottest fire, that God in His mercy and goodness blesses us. I read this about actor Kevin Bacon. I do not know who he is. Some of you will know who he is. He did a few movies, I guess. But it was interesting what happened when he was talking to his six-year-old son. I guess he's an actor who's done a number of movies. I don't know which ones he's done. But he, he was talking to his six-year-old son, and his son said this to his dad, to the actor, Hey, Dad, you know in the movie when you swing from the rafters in that building? That's really cool. How did you do that? He said, I told my son, well, I didn't do that part. It was a stuntman. But what's a stuntman, my son asked. Well, that's someone who dresses like me and does things I can't do. Oh, he replied and walked out of the room looking a little bit confused. A little later, he came back in and said, Dad, hey, you know that thing in the movie where you spin around on a gym bar and land on your feet? How did you do that? I had to reply, well, I didn't do that either. It was a gymnastic double. What's a gymnastic double, he asked. Well, that's a guy who dresses in my clothes and does things I can't do. There was silence from my son, then he asked in a concerned voice, Well, Dad, what did you do? <laughs> I sheepishly replied, I got the glory for it. Put your faith in God. He promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He blessed God and promoted them. And God blesses us through this. You see, this faith in God is a wonderful thing. When we exercise it, when, we, when, we, when it results in something in our life of choices, that God takes that faith and He does great things. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. March 15, 2020, I encourage you to put your faith back in God. Right now, there's a faith in a whole lot of other things. Professionals, toilet paper, water. This will get us through. And I don't mind taking some of those precautions. You know, we're disinfecting buildings. But we need some Christians. The world needs to see some Christians who will say, you know what? My faith is in God. There's no fire that's too hot. There's no king that's too great. There's no image that's too tall that's bigger than my God. And God will take that faith. He says in the New Testament, He'll move mountains with, if it's this big. He'll do great things with our simple faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. I encourage you to choose today. I believe God no matter what. You're afraid today? Believe God. You're worried? Believe God. You're confused? Believe God. You're persecuted? Believe God. Whatever the case may be, would you believe God today? Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for these Hebrew children who believed you more than what their eyes said or their ears, who believed you over tremendous potential pain. And Lord, what a tremendous result. Lord, not only did you rescue them, Lord, you exalted them, and ultimately your name was uplifted. Lord, I pray 
that maybe there's someone here today who needs to be reminded that you're a good God and you're a big God. Or there may be someone here or watching somewhere else who has some struggles, has some worry. Lord, may they today commit again to believe you and have faith in you. And with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder if someone would say this morning, Pastor, would you pray for me? As you spoke, God spoke to me, and I'm dealing with a particular issue right now or I'm, I'm struggling, and there's a temptation to, to not display the faith in God that I ought to have. Would you pray for me that I'd keep my faith strong in the one who has saved me? While you spoke, Pastor, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me this morning? Would you slip your hand up, slip back down? I'd love to pray for you. Amen. 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 Who else? Amen. I wonder if there's someone here who would say, Pastor, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm on my way to heaven. If I die today, I don't know uh, that I'd go to heaven. I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'm, I'm not sure about that, but I'd like to be sure. And while you're speaking this morning, something was going on in my heart, and I'm not sure I'm on my way to, on my way to heaven, but I want to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. But would you slip your hand up, slip back down? I'd love to pray for you this morning. You may be watching somewhere else. You know, the Bible makes it really easy to trust Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that we can just believe on Him. Believe that, that He came to earth as a Son of God and lived a sinless life. And at the end of His life, they crucified Him and they buried Him. But three days later, God raised Him from the dead. The Bible says that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. And I wonder, this morning you may be joining us online, and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. I would encourage you to pray today and ask Jesus to save you. Often we help those here at First Baptist Church to pray a simple prayer like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe you died on the cross for me. Would you save me and take me to heaven? And I would encourage you, if you're out there and you've never trusted Christ, that today, if you, if you could say that and mean that from your heart, that you tell the Lord that, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe you died on the cross for me. Would you please save me and take me to heaven? And I would encourage you, if you've never prayed that before, to pray that today. He'll hear you, and he'll save you. And if you prayed that and you're joining us online, I'd love to know about that and give, send you some material to encourage you. Would you send us an email, a text, or a call, or a comment online? Lord, you've seen these folks who have been touched by you this morning. Lord, I pray that if there's one who is not sure that they have a home in heaven, that today they would trust you. Lord, bless this time in Jesus' name.